This is the Zelensky 60 Minutes video interview debunked. And in this uh, video, what I want to do is go through line by line the interview that Vladimir Zelensky, president of Ukraine, did with 60 Minutes recently. And there are a number of things I found in there, about eight different points that I found very surprising that these were said on national TV. Uh, but before I do that, I want to play a clip, and this is from last fall. This is the EU's Joseph Burrell, otherwise known as Jungle Joseph. And what he says in this interview is that Europe is a garden and the rest of the world is a jungle. And I really believe that that encapsulates the conflict in Ukraine and what it's really over. Um, the neocons and the neoliberal globalists in the West, what they really, what they really see in the world is a, a chance for supremacy, for dominance, for uh, neoliberal, neoconservative, global hegemony, unipolarity, and what they want to see is um, if the if the nations don't invade us, well, we will go and invade them before they do it to us. So it's an interesting, um, interesting statement that he makes. Europe is a garden. We have built a garden. The rest of the world, most of the rest of the world, it's a jungle. And the jungle could invade the garden. And the gardeners should take care of it to take care of the garden, but they will not protect the garden by, by walls, by building walls. A nice small garden surrounded by high walls in order to prevent the jungle coming in is not going to be a solution because the, the jungle has a strong growth capacity and the wall will never be high enough in order to protect the garden. The gardeners have to go to the jungle. The Europeans has to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. Otherwise, the rest of the world will invade us by different ways and means. Yes, this is my most important message. We have to be much more engaged with the rest of the world. We are privileged people. We built a combination of these three things political freedom, economic prosperity, social cohesion. Okay, so obviously that can be taken in different ways. Um, the way that it was taken by the United Arab Emirates was that he was saying something very racist, and I agree that it is racist. Um, I don't know if he meant it to mean that we need to go and invade the rest of the world to keep them from invading us, but um, that's certainly how one way you can interpret it. All right, this is um, Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky. This is a 60 Minutes interview transcript. And there is a couple of things I highlighted here, but what I want to do is just go through the whole thing and um, just play it. And I'm going to pause at places that um, I want to comment on. Tonight, Scott Pelley reports from Ukraine, where he sat down with Pre... We'll continue. Oops in a moment. We met President Zelensky as he prepared to depart Kyiv for the United States. This week he will speak at the UN and meet President Biden. U.S. officials tell us that over nearly 600 days, almost half a million troops have been killed or wounded. Both sides altogether. Part of the cost so far of Vladimir Putin's unprovoked invasion. Yeah, the first thing I want to point out is that that number, half a million troops, um, Ukraine does not release the number of its troops that are killed. Russia, Russia does, and there are estimates. Um, what the press will tell you is that Russia has lost twice as many, and yet they'll also tell you that Russia has seven times as much ammunition and firepower. So that doesn't really make sense. But I think that, um, you know, that's accurate. Half a million wounded and killed. Okay. 
and if you do a two to if you do a uh, two to one ratio, uh, that would be something like um, you know one you know two hundred thousand to five million or something two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand something like that, um, or or less than that. So I don't know how many people have been killed. I have no idea, but it's a very high number. And what we're doing by funneling in money for weapons is we're prolonging the suffering on both sides and we're actually destroying Ukraine. Every single new me, liberal media uh, report will always call it an unprovoked invasion. They never talk about uh, the nine year war in Donbass. It went on for eight years before Putin invaded. Um, there was always negotiations going on behind the scenes. And recently there was even an admission by a European official who said that, look, you know, we had a chance in December of 2021 to accept Putin's um, negotiated settlement. And it would have included keeping uh, the eastern territories and Donbass as part of Ukraine. And the only real concession they had to make was not to join NATO. So this whole war is about the provocation of NATO encroaching on Russia's borders. Uh, we wouldn't want Russia or China to encroach on our borders in Mexico or place nuclear weapons in Cuba. We stopped that. And so now that Russia is doing the same thing, we call it unprovoked. So I, I just find it to be very intellectually dishonest that they don't even recognize the, the war in Donbass as a provocation. And they don't talk about, uh, they need to say unprovoked every single time you hear it because they know if you listen to it over and over again, eventually people will be brainwashed into accepting it. We spoke to Zelensky on Thursday. He told us that his people are dying every day to prevent World War III. We're defending the values of the whole world, Zelensky said. And these are Ukrainian people who are paying the highest price. We are truly fighting for our freedom. We are dying. We're not fiction. We're not a book. We're fighting for real with a nuclear state that threatens to destroy the world. The United States has contributed about $70 billion to your war effort. And I wonder if you expect that level of support to continue. The United States of America is supporting Ukraine financially, and I'm grateful for this. I just think they're not supporting only Ukraine alone. If Ukraine falls, Putin will surely go further. What will the United States of America do when Putin reaches the Baltic states, when he reaches the Polish border? He will. Okay, so this is known as the domino theory. This is what I was told as a boy uh, that we're fighting in Vietnam to keep the Soviet Union from going to, you know, the Philippines, to Australia, New Zealand, and finally coming to the United States. The domino theory has pretty much been debunked. And for Russia, which is, you know, less than half the size of the Soviet Union to roughly half the size to, um, you know, try to take Poland and the Baltic states and so on, that's unsubstantiated. There's no evidence for that. Russia currently does not have the troops to do that and they don't have the money to do that. Um, if you look at how things are going in Ukraine, people say that, well, you know, um, things are going that very badly for Russia and Ukraine. And yet they say, well, at the same time, they say, well, we have to stop them in Ukraine. Otherwise, they're going to take over Europe. So I think that on its face is absurd and people should recognize that, so. so this is a lot of money. We have a lot of gratitude. What else must Ukraine do for everyone to measure our huge gratitude? We are dying in this war. Look, if Ukraine falls, what will happen in 10 years? Just think about it. If the Russians reach Poland, what's next? A third world war? What will it take? Another 70 billion? I don't have an answer. The whole world has to decide whether we want to stop Putin or whether we want to start the beginning of a world war. We can't change Putin. Russian society has lost the respect of the world. They elected him and re-elected him 
and raised a second Hitler. They did this. We cannot go back in time, but we can stop it here. Okay, this is something I find very remarkable. He's saying that Putin it needs to be stopped, but the enemy is not Putin. We can't change him. The enemy is the whole of the Russian people who support Putin. Now, that is true that Putin has won every election with between, you know, something like 60 to 80 percent of the vote. I think the lowest uh, election that he won was uh, well, well over 50 percent in the first round. So the Russian people support Putin. That's true. But to just allow that statement to go to say that, you know, we're in a war against the Russian people because the Russian people are evil. That is racism, just like Joseph Burrell talked about earlier. Russia is a jungle and we have to stop them from invading us because they're fighting with Ukraine and it's the Russian people that need to be defeated. Ukraine stopped the Russian advance, but at a terrible cost. Ruined cities, millions of refugees, untold thousands of dead. All for Vladimir Putin's nation-building vanity. Okay, and here is the other thing. Russia bombs civilians. Russia commits war crimes, but Ukraine does not. R Ukraine doesn't hit civilian targets in Russia with drones. Uh, Ukraine doesn't can constantly bomb the city of Donetsk, which is in their own territory, according to them. Uh, when they declared a, uh, a terrorist, anti-terrorist operation back in 2014, it wasn't just the military that was targeted, but it was people. Uh, and th there were no military targets. So um, yes, in war, there's collateral damage. And what the Russians say is that they are aiming at military targets that are in civilian areas. So that's a war crime, not on the part of the Russians, but on the part of Ukraine. Uh, the second thing about this I think is amazing is that they say this is all for Vladimir Putin's nation building value. In other words, like he's dragging all of the country along with him because he's a vain person that just wants to build up Russia to be bigger than it already is. And again, it doesn't talk at all about the reasons given Right, NATO aggression in Eastern Europe, which has been, you know, cited a hundred times in the past thirty years by Russia, and even many Western analysts agree that's a provocation, and they don't talk about um, wars on Russia's border that have been provoked by the United States and Georgia, Chechnya, uh, color revolutions that failed in Kazakhstan and Belarus, and also um, you know other. Um, regime changes in Eastern Europe that push those countries towards NATO. And they don't talk about the um, Euromaidan re uh, revolution that was instigated by the United States and the war in Donbass. So it's, it's very dishonest. You don't have to be pro-Russia to recognize that there's another side and just do good journalism and, and present what Russia actually says is the cause of the war. Today, the war is fought on a 700 mile front the red area is the 20% of Ukraine still occupied by Russia. I wanted to point out that at the very beginning of the military operation, what Putin said the stated goal was, one of the stated goals, was to protect the people from Donbass from, um, from Nazis, basically the Nazi militias that were terrorizing civilians, that were bombing civilian territories, and so on. So what they did was they came from the north, from the northeast, and from the south. They established a land bridge up to the um, the river, and they were able to go beyond the land bridge into Kyrgyzstan city and beyond that, almost up to um, Mykola. Um, and then they withdrew from this area, they withdrew from Kiev, and they were pushed out of Kharkiv and parts of um, Lugansk. And then recently they were able to take back most of Lugansk, and they're working on securing the rest of Donbass, which is uh, Donetsk, this whole area is Donetsk. So, um, the Russians have, this area is more sparsely populated than the eastern area. Like Donetsk is the most heavily populated along the Black uh, Sea of Azov coast, which is attached to the Red Sea, and then along the border of Russia. And Lugansk is a more sparsely populated territory, as, in, as is this other territory that they occupied earlier. 
So the closer you get to the Russian border and the closer you get to Crimea, the more pro-Russian the people are and the more Russian ethnicity you have there. And so that's the area that Russia has stated that they were trying to protect in the beginning. So their goal is to push out the Nazi militias, um, to demilitarize this whole area so that they're not being constantly attacked, and then to get the Kiev government to agree to be non-NATO status. So that's what they're doing. Uh, that's, that's never stated. It's always just he's a madman that's trying to take over the world, something like that. This is where Western donated tanks were supposed to punch through, cutting the Russian force in half. But trenches, minefields, and artillery stopped the armored advance. Now, it's an artillery duel, with each side firing about 40,000 shells a day. Ukrainian infantry is advancing bloody yards at a time. It's World War I with drones. How would you describe the fighting at the front? It's a difficult question. I'll be completely honest with you. We have the initiative. This is a plus. We stopped the Russian offensive and we moved into a counteroffensive. But despite that, it's not very fast. It is important that we are moving forward every day and liberating territory. You have about six weeks of good weather left, and I wonder after that point, will the front be frozen in place? We need to liberate our territory as much as possible and move forward. Even if it's less than half a mile or a hundred yards, we must do it. We can't lose time. Forget about the weather and the light. I want to move forward a little bit because this is very important. Um, he talks about whether or not the Ukrainians are firing at um, Russian civilians at Moscow high rises and so Russian? on. We decided to try the question another way. What message is being sent with these drone strikes in Russia? You do know that we use our partner's weapons on the territory of Ukraine only, and this is true. But these are not punitive operations, such as they carry out killing civilians. But Russia needs to know that wherever it is, whichever place they use for launching missiles to strike Ukraine, Ukraine has every moral right to send a response to those places. We are responding to them, saying, your sky is not as well protected as you think. So it's kind of interesting that he, he denies striking high rises in Moscow and so on. And then he admits it. He says, no, we don't do that. He says up here that they don't do that first. No, we don't do that. It's not on my order as well. You know, how is it happening? You know, we don't. We don't do that. So what's your message? Well, these are not punitive operations such as they are doing, killing civilians. We have every moral right to do that. <laughs> we are saying to them, your sky is not as well protected as you think. So it's just, it's really amazing um, that, you know, we can be lied to and the lies are not called out. Um, you know, even if, you know, you support Ukraine, you hate Russia or whatever, uh, the media is lying, and it's not good journalism. It's just um, it's a it's a travesty. Hospital in Izium, civilians in a mass grave in Bucha. These are not military targets. What is Vladimir Putin trying to do? Zlomat. to break us. E Putin. And by choosing civilian targets, Putin wanted to achieve exactly this, to break us. This person who has made his way with such bloody actions, with everything he has said, cannot be trusted. There is no trust in such a person because he has not been a human being for a long time. The okay, Like I said, a lot of these things are disputed, especially the Buka incident that was uh, some of that, I'm, I'm convinced, was carried out by uh, a group called the Safari um, Reg the Safari Group, which is basically the Azov um, Battalion that uh, shot Russian collaborators and then blamed it on Russia. But same thing with um, 
you know, these other destroyed apartment blocks, um, you know, some places were actually destroyed by Ukrainian missiles, some places were destroyed by Russian missiles that missed their targets or got shot down and so on. But he's insisting that they're targeting civilians because he's not a human being. And this is just not, um, you know, it, it, it's, not, it's not really helpful because, you know, you can say that um, someone's evil, but it's irrational. Putin is not an irrational person. Um, it doesn't help Russia to kill civilians in Ukraine. So, yes, civilians are being killed, but to say that they're choosing civilian targets in order to break us. Um, you know, that's what the United States has done, by the way. And we deny it, so. What they say, it's sauce for the goose. Russians have suffered grievous losses without resorting to nuclear weapons. Here's the other one is that, you know, Russian losses are greater than Ukrainian losses, which is, you know, the opposite is true, but we'll, we'll let that one go for now. And I wonder if you believe that the threat of nuclear war is now behind us. I think he's going to continue threatening. He's waiting for the United States to become less stable. He thinks that's going to happen during the U.S. election. He'll be looking for instability in Europe and the United States of America. He will use the risk of using nuclear weapons to fuel that instability. He will keep on threatening. One thing I need to say very clearly, and if, you've, if you're listening, I want you to listen very carefully to this. In all the speeches and all the statements that Putin has given, he has never once threatened to use nuclear weapons. Now, Biden and some other U.S. officials have. There have been some Russian officials that have said things like that, but they're not, they don't have the authority to, um, to threaten to use nukes. Only Putin does. He has never threatened one time to use nukes. I'll give you a hundred dollars in the mail. I'll write you a check or send it, you know, whatever, however you want me to send it to you. If you can find one statement by Putin in the last 30 years, uh, excuse me, 20 years since he's been in office, 23 years since he's been in office, um, where he's ever threatened to use nuclear weapons. That U.S. election he mentioned worries him. His negotiations with President Biden have been contentious at times, but Zelensky tends to get what he asks for, even if, in Zelensky's opinion, it's generally six months too late. This week, Zelensky will press Mr. Biden for missiles with longer range. Congress is debating another $24 billion package. Which they'll get, they'll get that. Package. It's not much of a debate. And if Ukraine had enough of these modern systems, we would have already restored the territorial integrity of Ukraine. We would have already done that. These systems exist. Are you safe here? We first met Zelensky not long after the invasion, when his office was a blacked out... Okay, so what this is saying here, up here, he says, um, you know, if we just had enough of these weapons, if only the West had given Ukraine more weapons, they would have defeated Russia. And now the whole world has to unite to defeat Russia to avoid or maybe cause World War III. The reason why the United States hasn't, you know, really gone after um, Russia directly is it would cause World War III. Biden said that. So it's kind of like a, it's a very strange thing to say. Bunker. Be careful. Now, a year and a half later, we noticed a difference. As we were setting up the interview, the former actor used his talent to mask the strain. He smiled at a compliment to his wife. Yeah, so great. And then instantly he seemed pulled beneath a depth no one can know. There are a lot of people, and this is unsubstantiated, I'm not going to you know, I'm not going to uh, maintain this, but they believe that um, Zelensky actually has a cocaine addiction. And so I just thought I would, that's, that's another possibility. It's not just strain, but it could also be some type of drug use. Um, there are people, I, people know more about this than I do. There's certain things that he does, certain behaviorisms that he has that kind of um, points to being an addict, but. 
We don't know what he was thinking. It looked like empathy for the lost and for those who might be saved. Our time with Zelensky began in silence, a remembrance of the fallen during a ceremony to award medals of valor. Ukrainian officials tell us Ukraine and Russia have lost their professional armies. Okay, right here. <laughs> this is probably one of the most amazing um, statements of the entire thing. All right. Russia has 1.2 million troops and Ukraine has half a million. And yet they have no professional army left. And what they go on to say is, is that, you know, these are just volunteers, prisoners, draftees. Russia has no draftees. What they have is conscripts of people that have been in um, the army before. Okay. Um, up until last September, as a matter of fact, the majority of troops fighting against Ukraine were the Lugansk and Donetsk volunteer militias, the Chechen mercenaries and Wagner. Very few of the Russian regular troops out of the total of 830,000 mobilized have seen action. And most of the so-called conscripts are not draftees, but they're reserves that have had past military training and some experience, places like Syria and other places like that. So there are also a large number of volunteers, but they're not the majority. And so what's happening right now is the Russians are playing a waiting game for Ukraine to spend itself in this doomed counteroffensive and they're building up more weapons and more troops for another for another offensive. So even while Western sources have admitted Russia has more weapons than they had at the start of the war, and even more mobilized troops, they go on and say crazy things like this at, at the same time. It just makes no sense whatsoever. So even uh, Western sources have admitted that Russia has more weapons than at the start of the war. They've also recently surpassed Germany uh, in GDP PPP, they're the largest economy in Europe, according to that um, that PPP measure, which is um, a little bit different way of measuring GDP. It has to do with purchasing power. Uh, and they're also the fifth largest economy in the world, according to that measure, too. Right now, it's advantageous for Russia to be on the defensive because the larger army um, is always... Um, takes less casualties. They lose about one third to death in casualties as the attacking army. And then part of the waiting game is the economic war. Uh, Germany has been deindustrialized. The sanctions on Russia make energy for their factories too expensive. And um, I actually read a speech um, the other day. There was one U.S. official. Uh, they were claiming that Russia was seeking to destroy Europe's economy by refusing to sell gas and oil to Germany. And that amazes me that people are able uh, to say that kind of stuff because, um, you know, it's the U.S. that put sanctions on Germany. It's actually not on Russia, but on Germany, telling Germany that they couldn't buy Russia gas. And it's actually the West that blew up the, Rus the uh, Nord Stream pipeline and not Russia. Now the forces are made up of volunteers, draftees, and in Russia's case, prison inmates. Ridiculous. Zelensky statement. counts his dead in casualty reports each morning. Okay, and here's, I just want to kind of move ahead to the last part because this is. Peace. Me. No. Has Volodymyr Zelensky reaching out again to the United Nations and the United States, hoping to convince the Allies that the world can be safe only when Ukraine is whole? Can you give up any part of Ukraine for peace? Me. No, this is our territory. You must have it all, including Crimea. So I'm not even going to play this last part because this is just deflection. Uh, there is a law passed by Zelensky. So the reporter asks him, you know, what about negotiating in exchange for land? Are you willing to give up any land for peace? So Zelensky actually had a law passed forbidding negotiations with Putin. So th that's a very bad question. It shows like incompetence on the side of the interviewer and so on. So I just want to end by saying that, you know, um, this is a very sad fact that Western powers were never planning on engaging, on engaging with Russia, with NATO directly. Like we never planned to go after a nuclear power with NATO. 
But instead, the idea was to provoke a war with Ukraine in order to sanction Russia into economic collapse. So that's backfired. Uh, Russia now has the largest um, economy in Europe in terms of purchasing power parity. And that's backfired, that's backfired big time. So they no longer have an off-ramp or reverse gear. I'm going to show you real quick one graphic, and I'll put this in the, um, in the, in the notes below. This is the total estimated military personnel in Russia that they can draw on. They have active soldiers, 830,000. Uh, the reserves are 250,000. Paramilitary units are um, 250,000. These are Ukraine's army, their aircraft versus Russia's aircraft, helicopters. You go down the list. Ukraine has lost this war. And unless NATO is going to invade Russia and start World War III, um, it's time to wrap it up and to do negotiations. Russia will get, in addition to what they wanted originally, um, they will get non-NATO status for Ukraine. Um, they will also um, be able to um, get the people of Donbass and those 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 republics and those now Russian regions that speak Russian, those will now become part of Russia. And they're not going back to Ukraine. That's just not happening. Ukraine doesn't have to recognize it, but they're not going back. And unless the United States is willing to um, go to war with Russia, then it's time, the time has come to, um, you know, kind of let's, let's withdraw, make a ceasefire, do a settlement and agree that Ukraine is never going to join NATO. Um, I had a friend of mine tell me um, recently, I'm going to read a letter I got. This is, I'll tell you the name of the person. It's Rose Weiner. Um, she's a, some of you might know her that's listening to this. But she, I, I mentioned to her that, you know, these people don't have an off-ramp or a reverse gear. And she says, well, I think you need to ask who's on God's side. And I think it's the Russians. The Ukrainians are service and fighting for the cabal, doomed for failure, and the American government needs to repent for sending them money. They are sending the Ukrainians to fight in a war they can't win, and this is immoral. But then the U.S. Marxists, their name does not deserve to be capitalized, su supporting this war and also for transgender and child trafficking, and that is not the majority of Americans. So she's saying that basically, you know, the West has lost the moral war as well. And our leaders need to repent, but the majority of Americans don't agree with that. You know, so I, I, I agree with her. I think that we need to, you know, rise up as a, um, a Christian movement and actually fight Western liberalism within the West. And she goes on and says, so this whole demonic regime here and there and in Davos are on their way out, along with their Federal Reserve and the IRS. The principalities behind them are being cast out of the heavenlies and they are trying to grab and hold everything they can to keep from falling. But it is too late for them. It's not in the cards. They have been weighed in the balance and found wanting. The die has been cast and there is no return. I keep seeing a screeching cat falling off a table, grabbing to hold the tablecloth and dragging everything off the table as it falls. This is a bottomless pit they are being cast into. They will never recover. Now, it's real interesting that even uh, one of the Polish officials recently, I don't have the article right in front of me, but um, he mentioned how <laughs> saving Ukraine is dangerous. Um, it's kind of like trying to save a drowning person. Let's see if I can just Google this real quick. I wasn't planning on doing this, but... There we go. This is from News, News, Newsweek, which is a very liberal... Um, Okay, so so Nate, so Poland was Ukraine's uh, closest ally, even up to very very uh, recently. And um, so this is a Polish prime minister. Excuse me, the prime minister has said Warsaw will no longer transfer weapons to Ukraine as relations between Ukraine. Oh, let's see. This is kind of slow. But basically, that's what he said. He said it's like drowning, saving a drowning person. The person will. Um, hang on to you and um, if you don't want to be with the de on the defensive you need to have something to defend yourself with the prime minister added um, and he went on I'm going to do another video soon and I'll go over all this stuff again including um, uh, Polish officials rebuking Ukraine for supporting Nazism within their country and not putting down the Nazis 
and so on. So this is a major development. Um, and uh, there, there, there are European countries that are beginning to abandon Ukraine. So truth crushed to the ground will rise again. The eternal years of gods are hers, but when evil, evil when it is sounded withers, evil when it is wounded withers and dies among its worshipers, having no power of resurrection. God bless you, and I will see you soon.